The Gospel according to John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. It can be found on pages 112 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. After these things, Jesus shows himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they called nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to, Simon, to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, may your word feed us and fill us afresh with joy this morning. Amen. One of the things I've absolutely loved being here with you and being here with you on Sundays is how much you join in and how much you join in when we ask questions, in the sermons, in the prayers, in the activities. So please don't let me down this morning. I'm going to start you off with a question. <laughs> what things can you think of that you wish Jesus had never said? Things you wish he hadn't said? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Oh, that's a challenging one, isn't it? There's lots of questions about that. Any others? 
Oh, so Chris says, go and do likewise. So the, the smallest, the simplest, but the toughest things to actually go and do, isn't it? What was he saying that in response to while we're on that one? Can you remember? This is the good way to live. Go and do likewise. I'm having a memory blank on that one at the moment. <laughs> I should really know that one, shouldn't I? Any others? Things you wish? Yes. Love thy neighbour as thyself. Sounds so obvious, not so easy to do. And what about if we up the ante and say, love your enemies? He said, it's easy to love your friends, but you've got to love your enemies as well. It's a tough one to, to put into action, isn't it? Any others? Julian. So anyone who comes after me must carry their own cross. So a willingness to carry a cross, to suffer, that this journey might be difficult following Jesus. Any others? while we're thinking about this. Turn the other cheek, thank you. Sometimes something's hurt us that badly, we really don't want to turn the other cheek, we want to get our revenge. <laughs> okay, before you sort out the speck in someone else's eye, Take out that plank in your own eye. It's a good. It's quite funny that one, isn't it? But it's it's kind of meaningful for all of us. I've got one more on my list that no one else has mentioned yet. Any others? Okay, I've, I've got there um, forgiveness about forgiving those who've hurt us. So how many times must we forgive? Not seven times, but seventy times seven. So there's endless call to forgive, even when it's so hard. Anyway, all these things you've mentioned, they're the really tricky things to put into action that we might wish Jesus hadn't actually said or asked of us. And no one knew the challenging side of Jesus' teaching more than the disciples who travelled with him. And perhaps particularly Peter. And we meet Peter again today, along with some of those other disciples. Peter the passionate, the gutsy, the jumping feet first. The one who often gets things wrong but only ends up coming face to face with Jesus' grace and forgiveness. And I think in this post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, we find some difficult things, some not so popular things, some things that are going to really put Peter to the test alongside many of the other Christians in the early days of the church. But there is also encouragement. And I hope this morning we can take both the encouragement and the challenge that Jesus might have for us here today. So we have in this story a miracle, a reminder that Jesus is in the business of extravagant, abundant provision. Where the disciples had been out all night and they'd caught no fish, just at the least likely time as the sun was coming up, Jesus provided a miraculous catch of fish so large that it should have torn their nets. And very specific too, 153 large fish. And in this story, a glimpse of what is to come, a picture of life and mission that Jesus will be passing on to his followers to go out and fish for many. And next, the simplicity of Jesus saying, come and eat. He's got the fire going. And he's barbecued some of the fish. Even I, who does not much like fish, would probably have said yes to sitting down and eating freshly barbecued fish with Jesus and his friends. There's such a simple, gracious invitation here. After the astonishing miracle and the glimpse, if they could just see it, of what they were called to, the most important thing that Peter and his friends had to do right there and then was to sit, rest, and eat with Jesus, to listen to him, and to just be in his presence. And here, I think, is something that we need to remind ourselves of every day and before every endeavour. Have we taken time to sit and rest and listen to Jesus? Is what we do done in the strength of his leading, his provision, or are we tempted to rush ahead of ourselves? 
Have we no time to stop and listen to Jesus? Have we places to go, people to save, so busy that we forget the voice of the one who sent us? On a practical note, and given this was actually a breakfast, we could ask ourselves, how do we start our days off with Jesus? Now, my New Year resolution was to always eat breakfast. Well, even more important is to start the day with God. There is, in fact, a series of little books which have been around for a while called Breakfast with God. So if you don't already have an app on your phone or a study guide that you use on a regular basis, you could look at something like that. It's a very small, very simple way of just starting the day with prayer over your breakfast. We're all different on how we do our time with God. But there seems to be a good principle there of doing this at the start of each day. So Peter has witnessed this amazing miracle. He's sat and eaten with and listened to Jesus' conversation. He's watched Jesus cook and eat. So he's in no doubt that this really is Jesus, alive and as physical as ever, definitely not a figment of his imagination. But now comes the challenge. That puzzling conversation. Three times, hammering home the significance of this moment. Three times, causing Peter to maybe bristle with annoyance and frustration. Three times as an echo of Peter's own three denials, which caused him such bitter regret. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Then feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Then take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Now said with real grief, you know everything and you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. I wonder how Peter was changed by this conversation. It was direct, it was relentless. It was that most difficult question of all. Do you love me? Peter was being prepared for a ministry that would be harder than anything he'd known so far. It would take him with all his passion and boldness to a place of suffering for the sake of the gospel. He'd be up against the fiercest enemies of the church. It may cost him his life to follow Jesus. I wonder if this was one moment when, fed and sustained by Jesus, but challenged in a whole new way, Peter grew up into the person he needed to be to set off on that journey of building the church. All that passion and boldness, now given a new humility and seriousness, a realisation that God's grace had brought him through his own failures, but that Christ had a clear call on his life, and there was simply no other choice he could make. If this was a moment of transformation for Peter into a man of passion, boldness and humility, what was it that made that change? Was it meeting the risen Jesus? Yes, I think so, but many did and not all followed him. Was it eating with him? Well, again, others did that and not all were called in quite this way. Was it seeing the miraculous catch of fish? while Peter had witnessed many miracles? Or was it that question, asked particularly of Peter, asked three times, do you love me? Was that the question that challenged and changed Peter the most? So what if Jesus asked us that question? What if he asked me, Kate, Do you love me? How would I answer? And how would you answer for yourself? I think I might say something like, yes, but not enough. Help me love you more. It's the hardest question to answer, isn't it? And perhaps each of us has a variety on that 
Yes, I do love you, God, but help me to love you more. Peter seemed offended to be asked three times. He seems sure of his own love for Jesus, perhaps surprisingly confident. But it is Jesus' response each time, feed my sheep, that gives us a hint of what it actually looks like to love Jesus. Do we love Jesus? The answer may be found in what we do to serve Jesus. Not just in meeting and worshipping together each week, but in what we do every other day of the week. Do we love Jesus? Do we live our lives passionately, seeking to serve the poor and the marginalised? Is that what we do as individuals? Is that what we do as a church? Passionately seeking to serve the poor and the marginalised is, I think, pretty close to the heart of Jesus. So are we living lives that are unmistakably good news to our communities? bringing joy and hope in tangible ways. I think this is a challenge for me as I go into a different role, and it's a challenge here for us here in Hoddesdon, for each one of us here. If we claim to love Jesus, then let it show in the lives we lead, serving our communities, getting our hands dirty to serve those in greatest need, taking risks, and bearing the costs that this might bring, sharing the hope of Jesus with our lives as well as our words, making it real in the way we treat each other, making it real in our communities. And so finally, at the risk of sounding like I might break into a song from the movie Frozen, I won't sing, don't worry. If you love Jesus, let it show. Amen.